Hey, I'm Paul from VRP Rocks, and if you're a classic rock fan, you're going to love this interview with Corky Lang from Mountain. He tells stories about working with John Lennon, Jimi Hendrix, Keith Moon, Ian Hunter, Mick Ronson, Levon Helm, Jack Bruce, and of course, Leslie West. So here you go. Please enjoy these wonderful tales told by Corky Lang. Go, Corky, yeah, you, you, you joined Mountain basically in its infancy, didn't you? I mean, they just played Woodstock. The band was really, really new at this stage. So what was it like joining that band from the band that you were in? Oh, well, that was a, that's a long story, but I'll try to capsulize it. What happened was uh, Jimi Hendrix's manager managed to get Leslie on the show last minute. And there really wasn't a band the way I understood it. They had Norman Smart, who played on Leslie's mountain record there was the name of the record was mountain so that record was being promoted at woodstock so there really wasn't a band at that point until leslie turned around to felix and said wait a second this is going well why don't we get a proper drummer norman smart is a great drummer but he was a folk drummer he actually played with people like ian and sylvia gordon lightfoot and those people oh, yeah. so he was really good and but they wanted somebody that could that could hit hard at the time, I was not a hard hitter, but I learned how to hit hard. And at the time, all I had from the band I was in in Montreal, the local band, was called Energy. And we played covers, a lot of dance music. So I had a cowbell and I had timbales. I didn't even have a proper rock set. And uh, so when we started playing, it served the purpose because timbales, they're like neutron bombs. They really cut. So if there was a fill in between, so, so it cut right through the sun amplifiers and the marshals. That's what I had to deal with because it wasn't that sophisticated at that point in terms of the drum miking. So basically it was, it was like a rugby game. It was really hard hitting. <laughs> and um, I had a good time doing it, but I didn't come from, well, there was no real heavy metal at that time. Yeah. But as a result of having a cowbell, and the metal timbales, when I started playing, a lot of the, I guess the reviews would say, wow, the metal sounding. And all I did, I had those just to cut. It wasn't any, there wasn't <laughs> a sophistication to it. You know what I'm saying? So at the time, I, again, in the local band, I had the cowbell. And just to, if I can, I try to put this in capsule form because it goes on. I was playing in a local band while Woodstock was starting to happen late in April 69. I was in a local band in Nantucket, Cape Cod, which is a beautiful island. Uh, and it's um, anyways, what happened? We were playing this real funky beach club. And because of the heat that that summer, everybody got an air conditioner in Nantucket. Keeping in mind, it's just a small town on an island. And at that night, I guess everybody turned on the, and they blew the, the whole electrical electrical circuit <laughs> on the island. So there was no lights when we were playing. It just went out that night. Bam. And my friend, uh, Roy, Roy Bailey and Art had called up a girlfriend of his from Mississippi to hang out in Nantucket. And they were dancing. And they and then, you know, I was playing a bone critical creek. She sends me if I, you know, I was covering the band and I was playing and they were dancing and I had taken a couple of soul pills. If you get the drift and I'm playing and the lights go out and all, you know, organ, all the electric. And I'm sitting there with the cowbell, you know, just hitting anything to keep them dancing because Paul, she was hot. <laughs> you know, she was wearing a see-through uh, patch kind of dress. It was, and it was, you know, was, she was perspiring. It was like one of those hot fucking nights. Anyway, so I wanted to keep her dancing because, you know, I was like looking at her and I guess I'm like, hey, Mississippi. And I'm screaming at her because there's no <laughs> mics. And I said, well, I, anyway, so I started making up this lyric as a rap song. Mississippi and a cowboy. Keep them dancing. I always keep them dancing with the cowboy. Hey, Mississippi. Mississippi Queen, you know what I mean? And I and she started looking at me. And I went, ooh, I have a chance. Maybe I'll get lucky. Anyways, I didn't get lucky that way. Roy took her home. He got lucky. But I kept the lyric, the idea of keeping the cowbell and that going. Because basically, it was just rap. There was nothing. So fast forward, 
a couple of weeks later, I'm in New York and they're saying, Corky, can you handle, do you think you can handle the, you know, the drumming? And I went, yeah. I, I said, let me think about it for like two seconds. And I said, yeah. And so when we went to record it, Leslie just, you know, Leslie's, Felix, Felix wants, Felix wants us to write these songs. I don't know where to start. I said, do you have any lyrics? I happen to have written down the lyrics at that time. And, uh, here, I had him written out. I just put him in front of Leslie. Literally, just here's the lyric. Mister, you know what I mean? This is in a way down. I did the whole thing. With, and he goes, oh, shit. And he goes, bad at it. And he gets right into it. Within a New York minute, we had, the song was there. Leslie just started screaming what I was screaming. And literally, it wrote itself in the limo, as they say. Anyway, so that's, what, then we bring it into the studio. After This is towards the end of the mountain climbing sessions, mm -hmm. of which... I must say I was really lucky because I had brought in some songs from the local band. There's a song called Who Am I But You and the Sun, which became Yasker's Farm. And there was, I had, the band that I was in was a lot more commercial, I guess. Uh, and so I just brought the songs and my lady and a few. So I was lucky that way. So we bring in the queen and Felix said, I don't know. Unless he said, what are you talking about? I'm fucking rocking. You kidding? Anyways. We we played it the first time. Leslie and I look at each other. We got it. Felix says, no, no. We're gonna, 14, 14 times later, we do it. We still use the first one. So that <laughs> was it. The best part about the story with that, and this is serious as a heart attack. Felix, at the end, we're mixing Mississippi Queen. It's the end of the studio. We had 12, 14 days to make mountain climbing. And Felix says, says you know, Corky, you met Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, uh, yeah, I met him back in Montreal. And, uh, well, he's next door. They're recording the Band of Gypsies. Can you go and see if Jimmy will come in and listen to it? It's, you know what happened? The record plant, everybody's there in New York City. So I go next door. I said, uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Hendrix, uh, we're, we're just finishing a song. You mind coming? Just uh, get your, see what you think. Well, no, so he walks in, and needless to say, everybody in the studio is like, you know, there he is. He, sit, he sits down. He puts his head down and we play the song and everybody's like on edge and he picks his head up. And after the end, he goes, cool. <laughs> that was it. Cool. <laughs> so we figure we had something. And that was, that was the story of the queen. And that's when it became the Lee track, because when you listen to the rest of the record, we had the other rocker was never in my life that Leslie had written. And I had written before that. And yeah, it became the Lee track. And the only problem with that, we should have written like 15 of those at that time, you know? Anyway, so is that enough of a story about the Queen? You know, I guess, you know. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's, you know, that's the main story about it. And, and uh, it was a financial pleasure, Paul, I must say, you know, 50 odd years later, 50 odd years later, you know, I'm still getting, still getting royalties, Indeed. which is very good. Indeed. But, yeah, and no. speaking and, of royalties, uh, you mentioned time. the fact that you were kind of jamming away to, to the band and you were friends with Levon Helm, weren't, weren't you? And didn't you at once try to offer him um, a credit on the song as yeah. well, but he politely refused? Well, he, he was, yeah, I knew him from Canada and stuff. Beautiful man. And I used to drive from Toronto to Nantucket and I'd stop by his place and we'd sit and hang out. And, and I remember playing it for him. He went, cool, you know, damn, this that's a hot track, Cork. That's good. I said, well, you know, Levon, I was I was playing Cripple Creek. I was playing your feel, the back bat, you know? And he says, well, Corky, uh, you were playing the back beat? And he said, yeah, it was like a pubic hair off the beat. So it sounds sexy, you know? And a bap, a bunk. And I said, I really owe you some publishing. He said, Corky, I do not hear Cripple Creek in Mississippi Creek. <laughs> you can keep the money, you know? And I, yeah, I offered it to him. I mean, in a nice way. But, um, yeah, he was a big fan. He was a big fan. Well, Leslie lived in Woodstock for a period of time with those guys, and we got to be friendly with them. Beautiful bunch of guys. Beautiful time. Incredible stuff. We've got lots to talk about, so we're going to move on slightly. But in terms of Mountain, yeah. then, I mean, they remain a classic rock staple. I mean, Mississippi Queen is, is always on the radio. It's an absolute legendary track. The, the band are fantastic. Um, what would you say is the band's legacy, then, thinking back now? I would say... Uh, it's hard to think about because I'm in the forest, you know, from the trees. 
Uh, but um, the legacy, I thought Nantucket Sleigh Ride, which, by the way, when we did tour England, that's the song that people responded to because of that news, uh, that news station that played it. And that was great, you know, so we, we announced it. But the legacy of Mississippi Queen and you had Nantucket Sleigh Ride, I believe there was a classical background because of Felix. He, he was a classical musician and had a credibility because of the fact that it wasn't just blatant street rock. It had the street gut, but it also had this, uh, I guess, aesthetics. Or what do you, uh, what's the word for it? Well, basically, it was musical. And because of Felix bringing in Steve Knight to play the keyboard, so we had that wonderful sonic around it that Felix would, he really, he really created that vibe on the bottom end. So I'd like to think that there's a musical credibility to Mountain, even though it did, I guess, get known as the heavy, the original heavy rock band. And uh, yeah, I would say if there was a song, I would say that and uh, Traveling in the Dark, stuff like where we took it and we made it our own, you know, and um, and it, I think it came alive when we did tour the UK. And I'm not blowing smoke. The fact is the UK have big... They have better ears in a lot of ways. And I'm not blowing some. The fact is they seem to listen to different parts of a record. You know, the power of a studio has different, you know, I don't know technically how to say it, but there's a juice that comes through the studio in America and the juice that comes through the studios, like, you know, in, in England, just it's a little more powerful. I, I don't know if that's the word powerful, but uh, definitely immediate. And um, so when it came to playing certain things, we felt, I'll give you a perfect example. If this coffee's kicking in, by the way. <laughs> what happens, Crystal Palace was our first gig, oh, right? Yeah. Now, we were, we were so excited. It was our first big gig in the 70s, 1970. And the Pink Floyd, Rod Stewart, they were on the show. I mean, that's the kind of... Yeah. So we were up there, and you know, I don't know if you remember, Crystal Palace, they had a, a pond in front of the stage. Beautiful setting. And I remember Felix turning around and says, shit, how do we know if they... They're so far away because the audience is in the, in the field out there. They're beautiful. Big audience, too. And he said, I don't know how we're going to... Because usually you get the feel from the audience. And at that point, we were in the set, and we're getting that polite, you know, UK. Oh, it's wonderful. It's brilliant. Yeah. Are we getting that? And then Felix says, come on. And I said, you know what? Wait a minute. So I used to take the stick. I was playing so hard, the sticks would break, and I would get splinters. You know, I mean, a lot of drummers. like. So I used, I used to keep the extras. So I just, as I was playing, I'd take the stick off the cymbal, a certain thing, and the cymbal would jettison out to the crowd but there was no crowd it was a pond and so what happened is a stick went into the pond and people started rushing and diving oh, wow. into the pond for the <laughs> stick how else do you find out if they like you they're going to swim to it <laughs> that was a wonderful moment so you know i take that to the uk incredible stuff incredible stuff and i think as well at that time in the uk we, we can talk about the bands that were coming through that were being well received and blown up led zeppelins and purples and uriah heaps and black sabbaths and all that yeah. sort of stuff so they were receptive to that kind of heavier music weren't they they were they were and the thing was i figured out because all the english bands look great they're all dressed beautifully they look hot it's because they had the magazines in england you had three music express you had all you have any whatever it is they have pictures. So a lot of the English bands, they look great. The American bands, they're all looking like schleps with lumberjacks, you know, the Eagles. What are they wearing? <laughs> the flannel shirts. You know, we call, we spent a fortune on trying to look that way. But the key thing there was like, yeah, it was the time. It was a lot of energy going into the optics, you know. And so when we got there, let's see, we'd go shopping. We all go out. What are we going to get this? Cordoba. We'll go to Cordoba, get the get the leather, and then we'll go to Go Hill and we'll get the, the boots. We got to get the big boots. Here, I never wore those boots before. I felt like I was in a fashion at the Met Gala walking around these boots. But I'm just saying, we tried to look like that. And keeping in mind, there was Leslie West. In those days, you had all the beautiful lead guitar player, Peter Frampton, you know, all that. And so Leslie was. He's not quite the English rocker. <laughs> He'd go up, but he would dress. He would dress beautifully. He'd always have something 
attractive to him. And Felix had his pants all handmade. I was in the back. They didn't give a shit what I was wearing. I could wear nothing. They wouldn't notice. But um, that, that, yeah, that time, the bands, you know, a lot of it was the looks. And then here we come in. We were the prettiest band around, you know. And um, But it worked. Musically, it really worked, you know. We had Island Records behind us. We had yeah. that. We had it was a, it was a wonderful time. It was a wonderful time indeed. And uh, when you talk about Mountain, I mean, you, you released was it two or three records before you, you split up for the first time. And I heard you say before that it was almost a wasted opportunity. Obviously, Felix and Leslie weren't on the same page at this stage, but you said it was a wasted opportunity, really, wasn't it? That, that you guys split up when you did. Yes. <laughs> I mean, what don't you understand about yes? It was <laughs> fucked up. You know what happened was. Well, the fact is they were dynamically two different people. You had Felix, you had Felix, classically trained, skinny little Mario looking guy. And then you had Leslie, this Jolly Rogers kind of this. And from my vantage point, the best scene in the house, I had Felix, this little skinny guy in the lead down the stage. (laughs) And Leslie, and of course, Steve Knight was on the the side. And we weren't the typical looking band. And so as we came up, Felix was already a star. He had produced Cream, and they were like the thing. And uh, and needless to say, people were trying to compare us, which, you know, which was ridiculous because it was really a different band. And uh, and it was funny because in the papers, you see musicians would actually, especially with the New Music Express, you get these opinions from different musicians. I remember like a Ginger Baker saying, how the fuck can you compare Crane to Mountain? Crane was the thing, you know, and the fucking corky lag. Who the fuck is he? You know, that kind of shit. I'm laughing. Laugh, I go, wow, he knows my name, yeah. you know? Uh, <laughs> you know? And uh, and it was funny because, yeah, that was that that communication, on, you know, in the public communication. And I'll never forget when one of the papers came out. The headline was Jeff Beck. It's quotes. Leslie West is the best rock guitar player alive. Jeff Beck. I kept that, you know, and I went, you can't get any better endorsement than that uh, at the time. And I think, you know, needless to say, Leslie's balls blew up. And at the time, (laughs) Felix was doing his thing. Yeah. All of a sudden, the ego came into it. It happens to every band. We all know the stories. But yeah, it was a waste because at the time, May I say, and it, again, you name a band, there's no problem with the rating and who's in charge. Well, as the band was getting, Mountain was getting eh, commercial to that extent. Coincidentally, Leslie and I wrote, you know, the songs that were being played, except for the uh, Jack Bruce's uh, Themes and Imaginary Western. And uh, so Felix started taking the writing. All of a sudden, if you look at the second and third writing, you'll see where Felix and his wife at the time, Gail, they wrote. And it, you know, there was a little bit adversary situation where, well, come on, like, you know, I didn't really think of it that way. To give you a perfect example, Mississippi Queen was riding the charts in America. And Felix comes, I think we're in Nashville. So you're not gonna believe that I got some great news cork. Well, the second record's gonna be Who Am I But You and the Sun, Yasker's Farm. Felix sang it. And I went, he says, you're going to get, you got publishing on your second record. I'm 20 years old, whatever. And I'm, wow, it's pretty good. But I still thought, I said, well, wait a second, Felix, that's a ballad. You know, the queen is, is this hard rock thing. And I, and the, the next thing to that was um, never in my life. Leslie and I are saying, Felix never, you know, not we, but he sang it and he wanted his voice out there. So you get, a beautiful ballad, by the way. Yeah. And I was happy with it. Yeah, there was, again, a financial pleasure. But the fact is, it was the wrong move, you know. And then we had to catch up with the rock thing. Mm-hmm. So there were things like that. And, yeah, I mean, you had Felix, again, he had already made his mark as a producer and coming in as a bass player with Mountain. And so Leslie would, you know, you st- when you become that, when you start that overtly, I hate to use celebrity, but popularity, you want to know how much is yours. You know, how much, how much, and of course, the whole thing about a band, and this is where Levon Hill comes in. The band is always bigger than the individuals, and it will be that way because it's a fucking band, you know? And that's what I thought. I was like the Henry Kissinger of that band. 
Felix, yeah, 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 yeah. Leslie, I was, I was doing everything I could just keep it together. And, you know, God knows the other, cre- you know, the greed that comes into it. And, um, yeah, as opposed to when Wes Bruce and Lang got together mm-hmm. and there's Jack singing his ass off and Leslie, I'm going, and I'm in the middle of that one. Don't ask me why, by the way, but I'm going, wow. And, but there was no, it was, it was all the three of us split all the writing. Oh, Can well. you imagine, Paul? I'm able to co-write with fucking Jack, <laughs> you know. Who, by the way, when he's playing keyboard, he goes, Scottish, right? You know, you're fucking simple. I said, "What is simple? <laughs> simple, motherfucker, <laughs> simple." And I said, "Well, I didn't know to take it as a compliment or not, but you know, at the time, I think it served itself well because Jack was so far ahead of everybody in terms of musically fusion jazz, and Leslie, you know, he was just." Whatever Jack said, it's fine. It was it was nice. The only problem with that, I know I'm going fast forward on this. No, no, you can't. But but well, it just was. It happened really quick. We were still touring with Mountain uh, all over. It was free, by the way, and we were touring. Wow. Well, at the same time, Leslie and I were rehearsing with Jack, and we didn't even have a record out. And the managers, fucking, what's his name, Stigwood, and our management, they're booking us all over America. We don't even have a record out yet, and it's sold out. We're getting Jeez. all the talk about pressure. And that's the problem at that era, if I may say so, where a lot of bands were under total pressure. And that's what hurts. It's it just started. The pressure just gets to everybody. So what do you do, Paul? You have a couple of snorts of this. You have a little drink here and play and you get a little lucky and you go. That's what happened. How's that in capsule form? Well, wow. but it was good. It was, it was good, bad fun. It was really good, bad fun. Go ahead. <laughs> really good, bad fun. No, I was, I was going to say, you, you'd mentioned again in the previous interview that the fact that when you three guys worked together, it was crazy and it, it was kind of spiraling as well at one time. You say the crazy, bad fun yeah. and things like that. And that you were lucky to actually get through that period. Yes. Yes. That was too bad. That was too bad. I mean, they were putting so much pressure on. And all I wanted to do on a personal level, was have a little time to write the lyrics. Because you have Pete Brown writing the lyrics for Jack and Cream, right? And I'm saying to myself, oh, shit, how I needed that time. It would be like we playing. We have to try. Here, Cork, write the lyric. Cork, the lyric. I don't consider myself a lyricist, but when you have to write, you're a lyricist. And I did. I did the best I could. But it was kind of getting away. So I felt we never had a chance to write the songs together that we could. We had the energy. Yeah. And you're right. It was chaotic and stuff. But that was that was the street level of where we were. And everybody came down to that and just rocked. I mean, Jack came down from his pedestal, you know, with Tony Williams. I mean, that's beautiful shit. And Leslie and, and you know, we were just trying to find our way. We did the best we could, you know, <laughs> at that time. What can I say? And it was pretty damn good indeed. The music that you guys came up with is incredible. Um, well, just something else you. I want to touch on right. again, okay. just to, to move on slightly. Um, you, you worked with Leslie an awful lot, um, Mountain Reformed after Felix, and a few times you yeah. put out different records. But something you did do with Felix, with with Felix and Ian Hunter and Mick Ronson, there was this two more legends as well, these names that were throwing around that you're working with. Um, you recorded an album with these guys, didn't you? But it didn't get released at the time. Um, it did subsequently, but tell us about that that period of time and what was happening and why that, that record with you four legends didn't get released. Oh, yeah, that was keeping in mind that late 70s, right? We're just sort of like, what's going to happen now? The president of Electra Asylum, says cork i love you know all that the first record i put it out on that one and i wanted to get the lead singer at the time mick jones and i were working together with leslie westband and i played some of the songs that i was writing myself and mick says get a lead singer these songs are really strong and i went looking here and there and i this is for my first album so i felt that i didn't come up for the par he did he went out and got a lead singer and hands foreigner you know i mean it took him a year to get a lead singer (laughs) Anyways, I'm digressing. What happens was the, the head of the company says, can you get a super band together? You know, uh, we have, what's the guy's name that produced The Wall? A very famous uh, producer from Canada. I can't think of his name. He was going to produce us. You'll think about it. We'll Google it. Yeah. Uh, the, point, <laughs> the point is, is that I knew Ian really well. We got together. And Ian says, Bob Ezrin? Yeah, good one. 
Bob you Ezra. get behind the first curtain. You got it, Paul. Good for you. <laughs> Bob Ezra. Bob was going to produce it. I mean, it was going to be. And, you know, Ian says we get, you know, at the time, um, Ian was in between millions, I guess. And he had just, he, he didn't have a deal. And so he figured, I go, yeah, this will be good. And we brought in Steve Hunter to play. We brought in Lee Michaels, if you believe it. I okay. love Lee Michaels. But the trouble is he smoked all his pot, went into Ian Hunter's piano. And it was a fallout on that. And we had Andy Fraser playing bass. Who I uh-huh. loved him. Yeah. Great guy. So it was beginning to take shape. We even called, we even called um, the traffic, uh, come on, Steve Winwood. He was yeah. in this, living, in a, living in a tent. Yeah, we called. We were calling. We said, My we got wife. money. We got a record deal. Come on board. And at the time, and then what happened is the Rose came out with Bette Midler. We lost Steve Hunter. He was off to L.A. All of a sudden, it started disintegrating to where and Andy Fraser was going back to some something. And, you know, it was and we did record in this studio up in Briarcliff. And I'm trying to figure at that point, it was Ian and myself. And there was Felix that, you know, doing basically nothing. I said, Felix, why don't you come in and just play bass? Don't worry about anything else. So we did. We went to the power station, the four of us, Mick Ronson, myself, you know, and we recorded the basics. And then we took it to Woodstock, to Bearsville. Todd Rundgren came down, Paul Butterfield. And all of a sudden, this, <laughs> the music started. John Sebastian, it was really it was fun. And, of course, we had enough tie stick to go around for everybody at the time. We were up on the mountain there in, in Woodstock. Uh, and, um, yeah, it was <laughs> Eddie, who was Eddie Offord was on was on the um, uh, on the uh, board. It was great, and it was just developing. And then, and then Ian got a deal with <laughs> Steve Popovich. <laughs> it's like at that band spurned, spurred. And at the time, I remember he says, "You know, can we get Mick Ronson to help us?" I love Mick, but it's, it's going to cost us a fortune. Turns out, Ian said, "Don't worry about it." Mick comes and he just blows it wide open, right? Comes in the sweetest guy. And uh, yeah. And then we go in the studio doing a lot of recording at the time. And um, Mick Rods, and we record a couple of tracks. And during that time, going into the 80s, it was kind of like the big, you know, the we, they called the band at the time on the mountain. There was no name. They just called Pompeii. You know, they, yeah. we, it was like totally overdone. And um I guess Ian got a record deal. I still had my record deal, but it was half finished. And uh, Felix went off the. Pre- and I don't even know what happened, but it was fun. That w- that was really just creative. We got in there and we were writing songs. Ian's a brilliant writer, you know, and I loved his writing. I mean, I he st- he had stuff in his in his garbage in his basket songs that were amazing. I pulled, you know, uh, oh, ships in the night. I look at look at this. He said, "Oh, it's a fucking ballad, man. I'm a rocker. I'm a rocker. I don't want to put a ballad. Fuck a rock." I said, "This is a hit." Sure enough, Barry Antelope, Barry Antelope picked up number one. You know, I mean, this is in his garbage. Anyway, so the um, quite a time that was the end of the '70s into the '80s, and at that time, the record company they started, you know, signing all the smaller bands, you know, all the, I forget, new wave bands, mm-hmm. Elvis Costello, and they started doing that. And at the time, it was it was difficult. It was difficult because it was the 80s, and heavy rock was out was going out the back door. Uh, I, I did cut my hair. I tried to accommodate, you know, the punk rock. I played CBGBs. You know, nobody noticed, but I played that with some bands. It was a lot of fun, but it was the city. I was in the city doing that. And that's during that time I had this band called The Mix, who was produced by Jack Douglas, who did Aerosmith. And he loved the lead singer. I loved the album. We did. We worked for two, three years with Lieber and Krebs, big management. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out why am I talking about that? That segues back into Leslie coming out of rehab sort of his speak, say, hey, God, yeah, you want to come out and play some shows? And I said, you know what? Yeah. So I went out. That's when the new mound started. <laughs> and that's when Felix was suing us. I hope you're taking notes here, no, Paul. Try my best. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyway, so, and, and that's, I'm sorry to say, that's when that tragedy with Felix and Gail happened. Yeah. So it was like every, everything was starting to turn around. Leslie and I put together what we could. 
at the time. But when you have a guy like Felix, if I may so, say so on the show, you, you know, certain people in a band are the mainstays. That's point zero. You know, Felix was able to work with Leslie. I was good, but I wasn't that good. And we brought in some people. Again, Mick Jones played with us. And, and that's when I sort of bailed. I sort of went out to do what I do. And um, it's in the book. It's in the book. It is <laughs> in, in the, the book. book. Yeah, the book. Yeah. <laughs> Letters to Sarah. Um, Incredible. So I mean, we've got, we've got Letters to Sarah to come very soon and, and the finish uh, sessions okay. as well. But a couple of more little questions, if you don't mind, first, Cock. Yeah, I know I'm Go taking ahead. your no, time. I'm with, hey, um, uh, Paul, Paul. I'm sitting here in the country in Finland. <laughs> all right. It's beautiful here. I got wow. my gorgeous girl here and uh, it's, it's beautiful. I have time. Go ahead. Live in the dream. Live in the dream. Now yeah, here on Vintage yeah. Rock Pop, we like to hear these stories about these legends and you've, you've said so many already. It's been incredible. Uh, but one I'd like to hear about is uh, Keith Moon. You were good friends with Keith. And um, yes. yeah, that went on for, for a while, obviously. But you did have a little run in the first time you ever met him, didn't you? With a, a sequined Union Jack jacket. Uh, uh, can you tell Union us that Jack. story? I love that one. <laughs> yeah. So what happens in those days? A British invasion, Paul, comes in. And at that time, they had the musicians had to go through Montreal to get their visas before they do the big shows in the States, especially New York. So people like Hendrix were coming, or The Who, uh, Traffic, all those bands. The Trogs came through Montreal. It so happens that the band we had, Energy, had a studio deep inside, underground, th that we were able to play 24-7. And so we were opening a lot of these shows because our manager booked. It was like Madison Square Garden. The felt, you know, the forum was the hockey, the hockey rink, but that's where all the big shows went. Anyway, so when Hendrix came through, he wasn't as big in Montreal yet, you know. I mean, we're talking about, yeah, these what was the mid, yeah, late sixties, early seventies. We were in the, our band would open the shows for these bands because you had to be, you had to use a Canadian band. Yeah. So we lucked out. So we were opening the show for the Who, opening the show for Hendrix. <laughs> you know, it was great. So, cutting to the story about that, um, I I think I made it clear in my days. Uh, Keith Moon was my guy. That was my guy. Not Barzy. We were also at the same label over there. They were on track records. We were managed by the same people. So we knew each other from that. Leslie was very friendly with Pete Townsend. So it was good. Anyway, so forget the exact year, but we playing the show and the people in the audience never saw the Who Break Everything Up. It's Canada. This is their first big show. And yeah, they're going crazy and the crowd's riot and it was bad. And everything's flying. And I go behind at the end of the show, things quiet down. I go behind the stage where I put my drum set. I stay, you know, I stored it there. And I go and I see, see this beautiful jacket, all sequenced with the flag. What do you call it? You know, the Union Jack. Uh, yeah. Union Jack, the one that he used or the Pete used and all the yeah. promo. And I pick it up, Paul. And I go, I guess he doesn't want him. He threw it off. You know, we're talking under the stage. I pick it up and I put it under my coat. And I go back to the dressing room, hockey, hockey locker room. And I say, hey, guys, in my band, I said, I got Keith Moon's jacket. And they say, what are you talking about? Well, he threw it off the stage. I guess he doesn't, doesn't want it. Sure enough, at that moment, the locker room next door with the Hoover screaming and shouting, There's, I'm going to get me fucking get my jackets on stage. I'm going to get my jacket. I'm not doing it that great, but okay. Go with me on that one. I got to get on my jacket. I got to go. And there, and he's got no clothes on. He's going out to the out to the stage along the hall. They're holding him back because I'm going to get the. And he's and he's going past the dressing room. Not and I see him. I said, Keith, Keith. He said, No, no autographs now. I'm going to get me jacket. Me grandma made me jacket, and it's my first year. The whole thing. And I go, no, no, and he keeps walking. I said, Keith, I screamed. I took the jacket. I went, here it is. And he looks at me. And at that point, I went, what the fuck is he going to do? He comes at me and he grabs me by the fucking coat. And he says, I can't believe it, mate. You got me jacket. You got me jacket. I'll never forget you. And he gives me a great big kiss, as only Keith Moon could do. No tongue. Big kiss. I go, whoa, whoa. This is, and he says, walks away. I'll never forget you, mate. I'll never forget you. And he's walking out. And I said, I don't know what kind came over me. I said, um, Keith, I was going to steal it. 
And I said, what the fuck did I say that for? Anyways, he comes back, and this time his eyes are out of his head. And he comes up, he grabs me again. But you didn't steal it, did you, mate? You got it back to me. I love you even more. Another big kiss right on the lips. At this point, I thought we had a relationship, Paul. Anyways, <laughs> he walks out, and he stays just... I mean, the point is he remembered all that as we were on the road. As a matter of fact, when they played Madison Square Garden, happened, I took him for dinner somewhere. And the next day he says, you got to come to the show. I said, okay. And he gives me a little button because each of the guys in the band, they sold out four nights, had a button for that night. And he sat me right behind Pete Townsend's amps. Had a little table, a little, little coffee table with, you know, whatever he needed on stage. And he's sitting right there, Paul. He's right there, and I'm looking at him, and it's it's beyond me. So I'm looking. I'm trying to figure, what is he doing? How does he do that? You know, I'm, I'm right there. We get off the stage, and what would you think? Hey, what would you well, And he's walking up. Everybody's happy to go back to the church. I said, uh, Keith, and he said, don't ask me any questions. Don't ask me what I do. No fucking idea. And anyway, so we, we had a relationship. Fast forward again when I'm doing my – my tour, my band in California, and I'm playing the whiskey, all right? Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody shows up <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. except Levon, except Warren Zevon and Keith Moon. They were the only two people. <laughs> it was like 10 people who showed up. But they were good. And I remember because the head of the, of the uh, agency, the booking, all the big shots were there. And who comes backstage with Keith? And they go, great. But how many people in the audience? bingo you know but yeah so we had we had a we had a, a great a great time and when we were in england he would come about you know with the, to the to the uh, wherever we were staying and we'd hang out and uh yeah then there's uh what's his name the fellow that wrote the hubo great guy uh i can't think of him in there now i will It'll, I'll, I'll get a brain for it in a minute so he wrote the book on keith and it's in the book a lot of that stuff i think is in his book it's certainly in my book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that enough? Is that that's, that's a <laughs> brilliant lot. I mean, you know, cocky? Guess, Absolutely fantastic. Dude, I love dude, these am stories. I missing anything? Am I missing? Anything? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, no. The point is how how great. What a, I, I mean, everybody loved him. I wasn't the only. But the fact that he took me under his wing mm -hmm. was yeah. uh, unbelievable. Very cool. Very cool guy indeed. And and one last story before we get to the book and finish session. Um, John Lennon. Um, and again, we'll leave that. We'll leave the the bed in story to the book readers to, to to listen to learn about that one. But you actually sang yeah. uh, backing vocals on his album Rock and Roll, didn't you? Um, yeah. But tell us yeah. about that. That's a fun story. It was a fun story because um, at the time I forgot I was recording and one of the record plant and he was doing the album with Jim Keltner on drums yeah. and and uh, May Pang was the key there that was the weekend the, the last weekend and, and she came into the studio she says we need some background singers everybody want do you want to dance remember that song yeah. so because he was cutting all the songs that he loved over the years yeah. and uh and so alice cooper was there uh oh. i was there i forget a few of the i think steve tyler came and we were all just the five <laughs> of us ten of us singing do you want it you know it was that was our background singers yes. and it was a lot of fun you know, and um, I remember going in at uh, in the studio and John was there and I'm listening to Jim Keltner play the, the bass drum fill on Forgotten, one of the songs. And I said to um, to John Lennon, I said, John, you know, that that bass drum feel is really something. He must have a great foot. John says, don't fool yourself, man. He played mallets. <laughs> that wasn't a bass drum. It was, you played the, anyways, it's sort of the inside uh, drummer <laughs> joke, but it was a lot of fun. That was, well, that, the record plant was where everybody sort of went, you know, and uh, everybody was there. So it was pretty, and it was New York, it was downtown New York. And again, that era, you know, that yeah. was an era. Incredible era and incredible names and incredible stories. And yeah. the best way to find out more of these stories rather than sitting listening to us is to, to get your book, fantastic book, Letters uh, to Sarah. It's something that came out maybe a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, I think, wasn't it? Before COVID went and yes. shut the world down. But uh, it's not your usual kind of rock star autobiography. Explain to us a little bit how it's structured and, and, and how it came about. Well, I'll tell you the best I can because my partner right here is listening to this podcast. I better get it right. She was really the writer, Tuya Takala. Okay, she was a she's a she's a brilliant brilliant girl, and uh, she wanted at one point she saw my Wikipedia and she said, "No, um, 
do you want did you want to come and tell about this? I can't keep on getting this wrong. The, okay, fast forward. What happened was over the years, I used to write my mother on the road, whether I was in Armpit, Nebraska, or Carnegie Hall. I and when I got back to the hotel, I'd keep in touch with my mom because I came from a big family. I don't want her to know. Don't forget me. So I, over the years, right up until you know the end of the nineties, all a lot of letters. I didn't know that she saved them. My mother saved them. And that, yeah, she saved a big drawer. And as my mom, when mom passed away, she gave it to my sister who gave it to my brother as each. And it came down and they were, they were stored in this rehearsal place that we had. And at the time, Tuya Tikala found these letters and she says, well, wait a second. You know, let's maybe think about this. Let's not do a story about, you know, partying with Ozzy Osbourne and snorting ants off the kitchen table. Let's make it a book. Let's make it a real book. And she is. She's an editor. And um, so she did. She we took we took the letters and we put them at, as little points, windows of time. And I would embellish what else was going on at that time in my life. And from the time I started in Montreal to the time, you know, till she passed away. So the letters are there. And then I so that that's, that would be the mainstay, the chronological stories that came down. And keeping in mind, Paul, I was very lucky. You know, I always say that, you know, people go, well, how do you do this? And just be lucky, get lucky, because I happened to meet a lot of these people, especially during the British invasion, before they were heroes. I mean, I was hanging with Eric Clapton and, you know, while we we're waiting for Jack to get out of the hospital because he OD'd in Montreal because he was really upset with the Rolling Stone review of Disraeli years. Jeez. I mean, all that shit. It's all it was that little window, big window of time. That, you, you know, if you're there, Bill Buford once said, and I always thought in life, it's about when you're born, you know, just, you know, and I go back to this, that in the 60s, well, in the 50s, to be a teenager was to be a nobody. To be a teenager in the 60s was to be an everybody. I was a teenager, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners would know yeah. about that. If they were around the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of shit going on and it was good shit. You know what I mean? And you had to be lucky to be there. And that's sort of what, what, what I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to be part of all. That. I just don't want to seem like a name dropper, you know, which I am. But the fact <laughs> is, the, well, the fact is, it's all good. And it just happens to be crossing paths with, with a lot of these people at a time when they were looking to cross paths, you know, everybody was looking for something, especially like you're talking about Ian Hunter. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know, and free was breaking up and Mott was breaking up. There was all these bands that so well breaking up mountain was breaking up. Felix, you know, Felix didn't want to tour that much anymore. I think he had, he was burnt. He was being producer you know, manager, he, he had all the titles, he had all the hats. So at that point, he was burnt. Leslie and I were far from burnt. We wanted to keep it going. But that era, the end of the 60s, early 70s, everybody was looking for something. They forgot that where they were was really what's happening. You know, I mean, those bands were great. And it's starting to come out now. 50 years later, oh, do you remember that band? Do you remember that band? You know better than anybody. You're interviewing these people. And they're telling you about a time and place. And it was a great time and it was a great place. Absolutely. And like we said, the, the book, Their Letters to Sarah, it, it's got all these stories in, but it's also got the personal touch because it is your letters to your mother. So I definitely recommend everyone to go out there and, and get hold of it. Letters to Sarah, it's, it's your story. It's yeah, fantastic. It's on Amazon. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. It's available in audio books too. And two, you forced me to actually do the voiceover. <laughs> and it's oh. like therapy when you're looking out, really? Did I do this? Really? <laughs> they were, listen, it's not exclusive. At the time, there was a lot going on. And uh, I think a lot of musicians were saying, yeah, I should get that written out. I ran into Simon Kirk the other night at the Dino yeah. Dinelli trip. And we were talking about that. Like before somebody else writes about you and doesn't get it right, maybe you try to get it right. So I think Tui and Takala got it right. And I think that's why it reads the way it reads. I, just, I had the story. She, you know, um, it's like, <laughs> like get back to leave on help. When he's talking about the band, he says, yeah. you know, we talked about the, uh, Robbie Robertson. and says, you know, Cork, he says, um, I made it up. 
he wrote it down. You know, it's the writing down. That's the hard part. I just love that one. You know, it's kind of a very a little, little stop in the back. Yeah. So that, uh, thank you for the kind words about the book. I appreciate that. It's just, I hope I got a lot of it right. Cause I'm still, still trying to, I'm glad I still got a memory, you know, and I mean, everybody else, a lot of people are dirt napping right now and I'm, you know, I'm trying to get it right. What we're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah.